founder of the English Department at Boston College, and I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Dan Patrick here tonight to this event. The event is co-sponsored by Fiction Bays and the Lowell Humanities Series, and we will have the great treat of hearing Anne read from her novel in progress, titled Run, set in Boston. Um, and after her reading, we'll take a short break for anybody who needs to leave at that point, and then Anne would be happy to answer some questions, and after that, there will be books for sale in the rotunda, and she'd be happy to sign them. Anne Patchett attended Sarah Lawrence College, where she took writing classes with Alan Gerganis, Russell Banks, and Grace Paley. While an undergraduate, she sold her first story to the Paris Review. She then went on to attend the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop, and in 1990, she won a residential fellowship at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. There she wrote her first novel, The Patron Saint of Liars. It was followed by three other novels, Taft, which won the Janet Heidinger Kafka Prize, The Magician's Assistant, and Bel Canto, which won the Penn Faulkner Award and the Orange Prize, and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. She's also the author of a memoir titled Truth and Beauty, about her friendship with the writer Lucy Greeley, and she lives in Nashville, Tennessee. <coughs> Excuse me. I recently came across a quote from an interview with Anne that took place soon after the publication of Bel Canto. The interviewer, commenting on the fact that Bel Canto is set in a mansion taken over by terrorists in an unnamed South American country, asks, was the confinement helpful to be able to define the stage so precisely? And Anne answered, yes, but it's not so different from my other books in an odd way. In The Patron Saint of Liars, you're stuck in a home for unwed mothers. In Taft, you're stuck in a bar. In The Magician's Assistant, you're stuck in a trapped house in Nebraska in the snow. Now, in this one, you're totally enclosed. Nobody gets out. Anne's writing does indeed map tight spaces, but for me, the central power of her work lies in her ability to explore these claustrophobic spaces so steadily, so gently and thoroughly, and from so many different angles, that she ends up working as a kind of shapeshifter, allowing the tightest corners to open up into expansive terrain. In Bel Canto, which I'm sure many of you have read, this means that the mansion and its grounds become a kind of dreamscape, expanding through the minds and hearts of the characters until the borders we're most interested in are not physical, but rather psychological, interpersonal porous. They push out against all odds, against the edges of the box. In all of Anne's novels, the tight spaces expand in part through the rich variety of perspectives she's both willing and able to imagine. A pregnant married woman posing as unwed, an African-American male jazz singer, a female Jewish magician's assistant, Sabine, who lives alone with a rabbit named Rabbit and talks to her dead gay husband's dead lover. You can figure that out. <laughs> what is most striking to me about these characters is how, while the circumstances of their lives can come and in, they are themselves not easily defined. I think here of Sabine with a certain persistence. I will stand on the one hand, say of her, she's a wife, she's straight, she's a magician's assistant, and how at the same time, in an increasingly intricate and moving Of what it means to be straight or gay or married, and what it means to make a 
Hello. Um, I have this joke that I make a lot because it seems for reasons I cannot imagine that I often find myself giving readings in Protestant churches. <laughs> and I always make this joke when I take the altar to give a reading that all the nuns that taught me for 12 years are now spinning. And I'm thinking, this is good. I don't have to make that joke tonight. And I was like, finally, they're all going, yes, yes, you've made it. You've arrived, the mothership. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here at Boston College. And I am going to read the first chapter of my novel that I have been working on for what seems to be my entire life. I have been writing this book for so many years. I, I started this book probably about three and a half years ago. I started it right before Lucy died, and I had about 50 pages of it. And then when she died, I wrote Truth and Beauty right away and, and got very caught up in that whole giant saga. I'm going to feel so bad if that's my cell phone. Um, <laughs> but if it's not, you can feel bad that it's yours. Um, <laughs> And then I went back to the book and discovered that everything that I was writing was horrible. And I threw it away and I started again. The ideas still seemed good. And I did that for a while and, and then I ended up ghostwriting a book for a friend and, and I went back. And then I ended up doing Best American Short Stories 2006, which is fabulous. And I just finished that. And that will be out in October. I had such a good time. I'm so proud of that project. But this book keeps getting put on the back burner. And I keep coming back to it. And it's actually been really wonderful to live with something for such a long time. I believe in these people so absolutely. They are an incredible part of my life. And so I'm hoping that I'm about halfway through and that I will actually finish it by the end of the summer. But you know, God only knows what what is between me and the end of this book. So this is the first chapter, which would mean it would need no setup at all. Uh, this chapter has almost nothing to do with what the book is about. Uh, the book, like all of my books, as Elizabeth pointed out, it's very myopic. It happens in about the space of three days in Boston during a snowstorm. And this has a, a fabulously huge cinematic opening. And we sweep through the first chapter, the giant panorama of the first chapter, into the claustrophobia of the little novel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make some adjustments here so I can actually see the page. OK, that's a little better. You can still hear me, yes. Um, the only thing that I would recommend is if you're going to drift and not pay attention, that's fine, I respect that, I've been to a lot of readings myself, don't drift on the first page, because the only, the only thing that's confusing or hard to follow is the first page, where everybody gets dumped in. After that, piece of cake. All right, here we go. In the bedroom that Tip and Teddy shared all their lives until Tip went away to college, there was a statue of the Virgin Mary on the dresser. This is not only my Boston novel, it's my Catholic Boston novel. <laughs> um, before it was theirs, it had belonged to their mother, Bernadette. And in her family history, the statue held a position of such secular and sacred importance that after Bernadette's death, two of her sisters asked Doyle if he would give it back to them. He declined, saying that the Virgin now belonged to Bernadette's sons, and that they were as entitled to their legacy as any other Sullivan cousin. These two women, these aunts, had supported their now dead sister in her limitless quest for children, but they knew that Doyle did not mean to give the only family heirloom to his oldest son. He meant for the statue to go to the other ones, the little boys, as everyone called them. And really, why should two sons, two black adopted sons, own the statue that was meant to be passed down from red-headed mother to red-headed daughter? If Bernadette's uncle, Father John Sullivan, hadn't come down firmly on Doyle's side, chastising his nieces for even suggesting that Teddy and Tip should be forced to give up this likeness of their mother, having just given up Bernadette herself, chances are that none of the Sullivans would have ever spoken to any of the Doyles again. That's the only part in the book that's hard. <laughs> it was a very pretty statue. 
as those things go. Maybe a foot and a half high, carved from rosewood, and painted with such a delicate hand that many generations later, her cheeks still bore the high, translucent flush of a girl startled by a compliment. The Virgin's eyes did not look up to heaven, but were cast down to the lowly creatures of the ground in a state of perpetual benevolence. She held her arms open wide to encircle any soul that would be coming towards her, while her pale and slender feet balanced firmly on the round orb of earth. There was a serpent crossing that earth, and she crushed it beneath her toes, saving mankind for all eternity in that one simple gesture. Likenesses of the Mother of God abound in the world, and in Boston they were doubled. But everyone who saw this statue agreed that it possessed a certain inestimable loveliness that set it apart. It was more than just the attention to detail, the tiny stars carved around the base that Earth sat on, the gentle drape of her cloak. It was Mary's youth, how she hovered on the line between mother and child herself. She wore nothing on her head but a simple, radiant halo, a thin wooden disc the size of a silver dollar and leafed in gold. It did little to compete with what was clearly her crown and glory, the thick red hair falling loose across her shoulders, dark as iron's rust. It was the combination of that red hair and the pale skin and the long, straight nose pointing down towards earth that made the Virgin resemble for all the world one Bernadette Sullivan Doyle. As she had resembled not her mother nor her grandmother, but Bernadette's great-grandmother before her. In the eyes of whoever had chosen the white of the skin and the red of her hair, this particular mother of God had been an Irish girl. The legacy of the statue, along with the statue itself, had passed down a maternal line for generations until they both became the property of Bernadette. It was a good story, and a long one, and so she had different versions for different occasions. There was the one that she told to Doyle when they were first married about a persistent and complicated seduction. Another one she told to her young sons as a bedtime story that had important lessons about the repercussions of lies. The third version was the most greatly varied. It was brought out for visitors who happened to remark on the beauty of the statue. This was back before they had children, when the Virgin dominated the living room from the mantelpiece. Sometimes Bernadette would turn her eyes in the direction everyone was looking in, as if she had never really noticed it herself. Oh, that, she would say, that belonged to my grandparents back in Ireland. Other times, depending on her mood or how she felt about the person who had asked, she would tuck her long legs beneath herself like a nesting bird and lean forward in the chair. She would start at the beginning. Bernadette Doyle's great-grandfather was a passionate boy full of big stories and high expectations. When he was still very young, he set those expectations on the lovely shoulders of Doreen Clark, a red-headed girl whose beauty was outmatched only by her piety. Doreen Clark had made it clear that she had no interest in any of the boys who took such a strong interest in her. She was leaning towards the convent as if a wind was blowing her there. No boy who tried had been able to distract her from her prayers and her good deeds, so despite all his best efforts, the great-grandfather's courting was met with no success. Despondent, the boy of 16 with a restless penchant for immediate gratification left his hometown in Esky and was gone for half a year. If Doreen Clark had any feelings about his absence, she didn't mention them once, not even to her sisters. Doyle could tell that his wife was settling in for the long version, and so he went out to the kitchen to get another bottle of wine for the guests. He could still hear her voice from the other room. It was not a particularly loud voice, but it had a remarkable ability to travel. It stayed with him no matter where he was in the house. Sometimes he could be as far away as the courthouse, and he felt he could still hear the muffled sounds of Bernadette in his ears. It was a beautiful inexplicable call, an ocean in a shell. When my great-grandfather came home, he was probably 17, Bernadette said. He looked leaner, 
handsomer than anyone had remembered, and he had a lumpy bundle tied to his back. He said he had traveled all over the world trying to put Doreen out of his mind, but the case was hopeless. No one could forget Doreen. And when he was in Rome, he went to Rome, I guess said, at 16. What year is this? Listen to the story, another guest said. And Doreen tilted her head slightly towards that second guest in a nod of approval. The great-grandfather was quick to point out that he had traveled all the way to Rome, and sometimes he implied that he had gone even farther. He met a sculptor there whose job it was to carve saints out of very exotic woods for the pleasure of the Pope. On one especially golden Roman afternoon, the great-grandfather, sick of his own loneliness, sat down beside the sculptor who was turning a block of rosewood into St. Francis of Assisi while sitting on a park bench. He told this man, a complete stranger, the story of Doreen's beauty. There was pleasure in hearing himself say the words. No mention was made of there being any sort of language barrier between them. It was only said that the sculptor was so moved by the description he heard, her slender neck, her delicate ears, the red wings of her eyebrows, that he set St. Francis temporarily aside in order to carve a likeness of Doreen Clark. He had meant it to be a consolation for his new friend, but the more he worked, the more he felt the presence of the Blessed Virgin beneath his fingers, until finally there was nothing he could do but add a halo to the back of her head and put the planet Earth beneath her feet. The great-grandfather had no money to pay for the statue. The suitors are always poor, Bernadette said, and she smiled at Doyle, who had not been poor at all. But the sculptor insisted he take it on the one condition that it be presented to the young woman back home in Ireland as a gift. It was clearly implied that the sculptor himself had fallen more than a little bit in love with the likeness he had made. To win the heart of a beautiful girl, have her represented in art as someone of even greater beauty. To win the heart of a pious girl, have her be the model for Mary, Queen of the Angels. Not a chip of paint was knocked from her long blue cloak. Not a single fingertip on her graceful hands were missing. The statue possessed a kind of perfect beauty that poor children in Ireland had never been acquainted with, not even in church. And so this girl, who was scarcely 16 herself, was moved beyond words. Once it was in her hands, it was heavier than she had expected, about the weight of a sturdy mousing cat. It left her breathless to see her face reflected in the face of the mother of God. She had been good her whole life without any thought of earthly rewards. And yet clearly a reward had come to her. She could reach out her finger and touch it. She was Narcissus for the first time seeing her own beautiful face reflected in the water of the stream. Standing at the front door of the bakery in the center of town where the great-grandfather had begged her to meet him for just three minutes, Doreen Clark fell in love with the statue. And while he told her his story, he batted away a bumblebee with his open palm as it tried to menace Doreen Clark, drawn as they all were to the vague lemon scent of her hair. Soon thereafter, they were married. The three of them, boy, girl, and virgin, set themselves up on the top floor of her parents' humble house and promptly had five children. Every morning, the girl, who was now a mother and a wife, knelt to say a prayer to her own likeness, and she was happy. The boy, who was quite grown into a man by now, had won the only thing he had ever wanted in his life, and so he was happy as well. People came by their little apartment on the pretense of visiting or borrowing a few cigarettes or admiring a new baby. But really, it was just that they never got tired of seeing Mother Mary as Doreen. Women could not keep from crossing themselves and saying clearly it was a gift from God and that its beauty was exactly like hers. Although the ones who were terribly jealous added the phrase, had been, exactly like her beauty had been. (laughs) Bernadette smiled. That's what you'll say when I'm old, she said to her husband. Look at that statue over there. That's what Bernadette used to look like. And Doyle leaned over and he kissed the part of his wife's hair 
And he said, you will never be old. No one implied that Doreen and her husband had a perfect life. They were terribly poor. Everyone was poor. They had too many children, including a daughter with one leg that was shorter than the other, whose thump, thump, thump coming up the stairwell was the sound that broke her mother's heart every day. He drank too much, the great-grandfather, but so did half the island. These were still lean years, a scant generation after the great famine, and our couple would have had no more nor less than anyone else they knew but for the statue, which was not only a beautiful object, it was proof of their love. Love between hard-scrabble young married people with five children was a thing in short supply, and so in that sense, they were better off than all the other hard-working men and their once beautiful wives. No one eats love, Doyle said. It was summer, and the last light of day slanted low and gold through the open windows. My point is that no one ate much of anything, Bernadette said, and cut a little piece of brie off to put on a slice of pear. I'm not saying they were starving, but these were hard times. Doesn't love soften hard times? I'd like to think so, said a beautiful woman, a neighbor of theirs, who was perched alone on an ottoman near an empty fireplace. But this is where the story changes, Doyle said. Bernadette nodded and began again. Then one day, something turned inside the Bay of Esky. Suddenly, the sea could not do enough for my great-grandfather. Every fish within 20 miles swam into his net. The more fish he pulled out, the more people there were lining up to buy them. He made three times as much money that day as he had ever made, and that led to three times as much drinking and the generous buying of drinks for his neighbors, and soon the men were talking about the statue of the Virgin. Doreen raised her hand and made a small gesture to the woman on the mantelpiece so no one would lose sight of the fact that they were one and the same. The men were making some mildly scandalous toast to her beauty and the beauty of his wife and my great-grandfather's adventuresome youth. A man called Kill Kelly, who was as drunk as the rest of them, leaned himself across the bar with the drink that his friend had paid for in his hand, and he said, tell the truth for once now. You stole it, didn't you? You just went into a church somewhere and you stole that thing right off the altar. Kill Kelly would later say that in his life he had never had that thought and that he didn't actually think it was true. The comment was born in the spirit of joking, the sort of cruelty that one has towards a fortunate man. But he did say it. And in that moment of merriment and slamming down of glasses on bars and drinking to a sea full of fish, the great-grandfather heard him and the words went through his heart like a spear through the side of Christ. The truth. It happened on a night when he was 16 years old and away from Askey. He was as drunk that night as he had ever been and still been standing And in some town he never bothered to ask the name of, swaying through the streets in a cold fog, his bare head damp from the air. He was looking for a dry place to sleep it off, and praise God, the side door to the church was open, a lucky oversight because those priests locked things up tight from drunks like him. He was a lucky man. He was a lucky boy, to be exact. All of the votive candles had been snuffed out for the night to be thrifty, but he felt his way along the pew and found a cushion to put his head on and went to sleep right there in the first row. And when he woke up, the light was pouring in blue and gold through the windows, spreading out across the polished floors and the pews and the worn cloth of his own muddy trousers. And who did he see in that light but Doreen Clark? the beautiful dream of his youth, right there on the altar, smiling down at him. He blinked his eyes open again and again, and he felt the warmth and certain light of love pouring into his open heart. Doreen Clark was with him. Doreen Clark would love him. 
He knew it like the stations of the cross. It wasn't just a sign, it was an atlas. Those were her eyes, those were her little hands. Those were her glorious iron rust locks that he had longed to touch every Sunday he had sat behind her in mass since he was a child. This could only mean that God had called on him to go home and win her back. He had to straighten up his ways. And the best thing to do would be to go to Eski, collect Doreen Clark, and bring her here to see the statue that pointed him so clearly to her. But then he closed his eyes and he tried to think. She would never travel to another town in his company if she hadn't even been willing to go with him for a piece of penny candy at the pharmacy. The mountain would go to Mohammed. He would borrow the statue for a week that it took to walk it home and walk it straight back. Surely, God made allowances for borrowing in certain severe situations. He took off his jacket and wrapped it gently around the Virgin Mother, who he was already coming to think of as his little Doreen, and he left the church by the same door through which he had entered. It was unnervingly simple, and no one saw him. No one cried out, thief! Mile after mile, he looked over his shoulder, waiting to see the hordes of angry Catholics chasing him down for kidnapping. None of them came. The farther away he got with his pleasant weight, the more he knew the statue was never coming back. He had the entire long walk home to imagine different scenarios of what might have happened, Once, he came upon an abandoned church in a town where every last person had died of a fever, and so he picked the virgin up and carried her away. And once, the church had burned to the ground, and he found her in the embers, unsinged, smoldering smoke around him, her arms raised up. He thought of winning her in a game of dice with a priest or receiving it as a gift of performing some act of heroism as yet unimagined, but then he worried that a better man might show benevolence and decline what was offered. As he scrolled through the endless possibilities, he lost his way to Eski several times. He would ask for directions, but inevitably wander down the wrong road and then double back again. He'd stop and ask someone a left at the white oaks, and then follow the creek downstream. But his head was too full of stories to gather his bearings. On the third day, he decided it would be better if the statue had come from someplace very far away, someplace deeply holy that would sit beyond all suspicions, like Rome. And then he had the statue made for her. And it wasn't a coincidental likeness, it was a tribute of his own design. And that was when he began to see himself as a great man coming home in glory. As ridiculous as his story was, no one ever doubted it. His proof was in the irrefutable likeness of Doreen Clark in her marvelous hair. His proof was in the fact that when he finally found his way home and told her the story, that she had agreed to marry him. Every man in the bar saw the truth plainly now, and the terrible crumple and blanch of a lie come undone. The great-grandfather, who was then only 25, turned his back on the crowd and fell on his drink in silence. By the time he had finished, settled the bill, and walked home, the news of his crime had swept across the valley like a soaking rain. All of the riches the fish had supplied had been consumed by himself and his kind, and he had been exposed as a fraud. By the time he walked through the door of his own house, there wasn't a single detail of the evening that his wife hadn't heard. And there the story ends. The guests leaned forward. It was dark now, and they had forgotten all about dinner. They wanted to know what came next, but... There was nothing left that Bernadette wanted to tell. It was the point at which she would sigh and shake her head. Enough of that. I have been going on forever. Who wants another drink? What about the wife, the guests would say. The wife. She shrugged. She wasn't happy about it. So they would wait, thinking that this was part of the drama. Many years later, her sons would wait for her to go on as well, but... 
That was actually as far as she was willing to go. She only told the ending that she knew to Doyle. Sadness, without any sort of redemption, doesn't make for good storytelling. And every time she started out, she seemed to forget that there was no fit place to end. Once again, she had been caught unprepared. Doreen Clark, now Mrs. Doreen Lovell, came to see in one night that her happiness, her marriage, and her children had all been based on thievery and willful deception. The Catholic Church had been robbed, and so had she, but there could be no extrication for her now, no returning to her youthful dreams of convent life. She was waist-deep in wet cement. She lifted the statue of her own likeness into her arms, touched the cheek that had once been her cheek. She felt the rest of her days stretching out before her like a gaping hole. How she would miss the companionship, the prayers. There was no imagining how empty the apartment would be now. She bagged it gently in one of the wedding pillowcases her mother had tatted with lace, a case she had wrapped in tissue paper and stored in the chest at the foot of her bed without ever once putting her head on it. Then she sent the great-grandfather out of the house and into the horrible darkness. Take it back, was all she said. Of course, he couldn't take it back any more than he could take back a leaf in a cluttered autumn forest to the rightful tree from which it fell, Ireland was crowded with pubs and crowded with churches, and all he knew for sure was that one night, eight years ago, he had stumbled out of one of them and into the other one. He didn't know which saint the church had been named for, Francis or Anne, Michael, Lucy. It could have been the Sacred Heart of Jesus or Our Lady of Laredo. It could have stood for fishermen or farmers. He could have walked to every one of them, knocking door to door. Have I stolen this from you? And so he walked to no place in particular. He thought about his sins, and he thought about his intentions, and one of them was quite bad, but the other one was really fine. He carried the virgin in his arms like a child, and from time to time he would pull back the pillowcase from her beautiful face and weep for his love of his wife. And then he would go home. That was more or less the way it went for the rest of their lives. She turned him out, and he came back again. Every time he walked down his own street, his children would rush to meet him, their dirty little hands stretching up towards his neck. Da, did you bring her home? They'd cry, and his wife would let him stay two days or two months, sometimes two years, until she couldn't stand it anymore, living with the burden of their sins. But she was like the children, too. Her heart always stuttered with joy and relief to see the bulky shape inside the pillowcase as the great-grandfather started back up the stairs. She would lift the statue from his arms and carry Mary, Mother of God, to her dresser, studying the face that had been her face, the beautiful, youthful face that was gone. Had that ever been the color of her hair? And then she would cross herself and say a prayer. People might think that Doreen Lovell should have given this statue back to the parish or at the very least willed it to them when she died, but she made it clear that the rightful home could not be found, that it was to stay in her family. The Virgin had made Doreen's family, after all. She was the reason for their existence, and so they were bound to one another. When Doreen was 68 and tired of life, she gave the statue to her daughter, Loretta. Loretta looked the most like her mother, the undisputed beauty of the family, despite her mismatched legs. She wore her heavy red hair loose down her back to compensate for the small inequity of femur. The other children in the family, even the boys, could never forgive their sister for winning the prize, even though they had previously loved her best and protected her from bullying children who mocked her in the streets by dragging one leg behind. When her parents were dead and it seemed clear there would never be anything even approaching a better life in Esky, Loretta packed up the statue of Mary and took it with her on the boat to Boston with her husband and her children. It was there that she would one day give it to her daughter Cecilia, the only redhead in a pack of seven blondes that included 
one John Sullivan, who would one day make her the proudest by becoming a priest. Celia grew up to be much more generous than anyone ever imagined. She gave the statue to her own daughter, Bernadette, on her wedding day, much to the anguish of Bernadette's two dark-haired sisters. Even her four brothers felt the loss as though they knew they never had a chance. There was no way around the unfairness, one beautiful thing that could never be divided among so many children. But anyone who saw it said immediately that was a statue of Bernadette with a halo stuck on the back of her head. It's kind of creepy, her teenage friends would whisper whenever they came over to the house. This was the chorus that was sung behind her growing up. Bernadette is the lucky one. And so she couldn't help but feel that she was. She had the statue, after all, the image of herself and her mother and her mother's mother all the way back to Ireland. How many hours had she laid on her stomach, staring at those blue robes as a child, touching her finger ever so lightly to the sharp edge of the halo? When she and Doyle bought the four-story that they couldn't afford on the wrong end of Tremont, she put Mother Mary on the mantle over the fireplace. Back then, there was only one sofa, a dinged-up chair, a little round leather ottoman that reminded her of a button. In that bright, empty room, there was no place else to rest her eyes. The Virgin looked so much larger and holier than she had in the clutter of the parents' house. Don't you think it's a kind of overtly Catholic, her young husband asked. Bernadette cocked her head to one side and tried to divorce herself from history. She tried to see it as something new. It's art, she said. It's me. Pretend that she's naked. (laughs) Once she was married, Bernadette didn't pray to the statue the way she had as a girl, though sometimes she prayed to a vague idea of God, more out of respect to her uncle Sullivan than anything else. If he thought there was something to faith, then there was something to faith. After their son Sullivan was born, there was more to pray for, that he would stay healthy, that he would be safe. She did not pray for Doyle to be elected vice mayor, though sometimes she prayed unconsciously for the speeches and the fundraising dinners to come to an end. She did not understand her husband's love of politics, but she prayed for him to have what he wanted because she loved him. She prayed for what she wanted as well, the day that she would have her own red-headed daughter to pass the statue on to, and then she simply prayed for another child. And then she prayed for her pregnancy to hold to term, and then she prayed to have another shot at pregnancy, and another, and another, but the prayer didn't get her anywhere. She prayed for the strength and the wisdom to be satisfied by everything she had, a beautiful husband, a a beautiful son, a loving husband. She accepted to pray. She prayed to accept God's will. She prayed to stop praying, a pastime that never made her feel anything but selfish and childish, but she could not stop. Then Sullivan was 12 years old, independent and wild, and Doyle was the mayor. They had spent two years on the adoption wait list, standing in line, just like everybody else. She did not ask for anything as ridiculous as a girl or a redhead, a baby. Any baby would be fine. Bernadette's religion was the large and boisterous family she had come from, and she believed in them deeply. She had meant to put two beds in every room in the house, She believed that Sullivan needed siblings as badly as she needed more children to love. She waited, and she looked at that statue, and she prayed. Happiness compresses time, makes it dense and bright, pocket size. Of those four good years between Teddy's arrival and Bernadette's death, Doyle can somehow only assemble two weeks of memory. Teddy coming to them when he was six days old, and then the agency calling back two weeks later to say that the mother had changed her mind, not that she wanted the baby back, but that she had decided her two sons should stay together, and would they consider taking, in addition, a good boy, 14 months old. It was exactly the windfall that Bernadette had dreamed of, something too good to pray for. Did Doyle want another child? 
did he want to? By the time they arrived, he could no longer remember. There had been a time early in the marriage when he had wanted to fill up the house as much as Bernadette, but in those years the children failed to materialize, he'd ceased to want them for their own sake. In those years, all he wanted for his wife to be happy. So when the little boys arrived, he did not think, finally, I have the children that I want. He thought, now Bernadette is happy. Seeing Bernadette happy after so many disappointments was Doyle's truest desire. And this is how he came to love the boys themselves. He loved them for making Bernadette happy. For four short years, the house was full. The virgin moved into the little boys' rooms and watched them from the dresser while they slept. It was in January, after the extravagant rush of Christmas, that Teddy got a cold. And there was nothing unusual about that. Teddy always caught things first. Then tips, cold, leapt to strep throat, and Sullivan started to cough. Sullivan got the strep, and then it went to Doyle, and they passed it around like that, one to the other, back and forth, with Bernadette doling out antibiotics and taking temperatures and running herself down further and further down as she climbed the stairs with popsicles and bright, shimmering bowls of jello. In taking the children to the doctor, she never went to the doctor herself. It was a pediatrician who touched her neck, who reached up from Tip, who was sitting patiently on the table, turning the pages of a picture book, and he put his hand on Bernadette's neck without asking her first. Do you feel this, he said, touching the lump that was there. And that's chapter one. And the next time we see these people, it's Tip and Teddy are 21 and 22. And Sullivan is 36 and just come back to Boston from Africa where he's been living. Um, So that's that. that.